In 1920, the King of Greece, Alexander, was walking through the gardens of his estate with his dog Fritz. But then a Barbary McCork, which belonged to a steward of the gardens, attacked the dog, and the king rushed in to separate the two animals. In doing so, he was bitten, but at first he didn't think a great deal of it. However, that night he began to suffer from a high fever, and sepsis began to set in. There was potentially a chance of saving the king through amputation, but no doctors present wanted to be responsible for such a bold action. So, the king eventually died. Now, you may think this was just one of hundreds of kings who were killed by an animal, but this one was particularly important. As Winston Churchill wrote, it is perhaps no exaggeration to remark that a quarter of a million persons died of this monkey bite. And thank you to The Sandbox for sponsoring today's video. And I am also giving away $10 worth of Amazon gift cards, so stay tuned. Anyway, The Sandbox is the world's largest multiplayer game where you can create an avatar and have fun with over 300,000 players and over 200 of your favourite brands in-game, including Snoop Dogg, Steve Aoki, The Walking Dead and Softstar. There's over 90 experiences right now and far more to come. As for my favourite experience, well that's got to be The Walking Dead because you will work with Carl to rebuild Alexandria, interact with Negan and even fight zombies as you go out and look for food. Otherwise, Season 3 is happening right now, but there's only a few more weeks left to claim rewards. They're giving away over 1.5 million sand, with the top prize being 30k sand. So, don't miss out and follow these steps. Download the game from the link in the description, sign up free using Google, Facebook or Twitter, and that's it. You don't need a crypto wallet to play, but you can use it. Then load into the alpha lobby and use the map to TP to different experiences, and start completing quests for points. And here's your chance to win $10 worth of Amazon gift cards. All you need to do is get to level 2 in the game first, then when you're in the alpha lobby, find Snoop Dogg, take a screenshot with him, and tag me, Snoop, and at the Sandbox Game on Twitter. I'll pick two winners in a month. So you can sign up today, and I'll see you on the Sandbox. Now, there are possibly many contenders to animals that changed the course of history. One was a little French pig that, in 1131, jumped out of a dung heap and in front of the horse of Prince Philip of France. Philip was then thrown off his horse and died. He was the heir to the throne and, from all reports, was set to be quite a glorious king. His death therefore saddened everyone, including his father, Louis VI. Then, his younger brother, Louis VII, came to the throne a few years later. Louis VII would go on to launch the disastrous Second Crusade, annul his marriage to Eleanor of Aquitaine, and she would go on to marry the King of England. So, the English inherited a chunk of land in France, leading in part to the Hundred Years' War, plus the Crusade estates lost some of their power in the Holy Land, all because of that pig. There was also another pig, this time a British pig, that started a war. This war began in 1859, when that pig ate some tomatoes on American land near Vancouver and was shot. This started the short pig war, but this was really barely a war. So the Barbary macaque in Greece is still one of the most influential animals in history that I could find, besides of course those that were the first to transmit diseases. Anyway, to understand how this monkey could have possibly killed up to 250,000 people, we need to look at Greece back in 1920. World War I had ended, but the Greeks continued to fight against the Turkish, hoping to claim more land. The concept they developed was the Megali idea, which would see Greece expand into Anatolia and thus unite with the majority Greek areas or the historic Greek areas. Fortunately for them as well, the Ottoman Empire had collapsed, and during the First World War, the Entente powers had signed a number of treaties partitioning up Turkish lands. The British and French took over Iraq, Syria and the likes, but when it came to Anatolia, the respective countries would have to fight for their claims. This was because Ataturk had formed a new government in Ankara, and, unlike the Sultan, was unwilling to sign away any more land to the foreigners. So the French went to war in the southeast, the Italians landed troops in Antalya, Armenia was set to take over a chunk of land in the northeast, while the British occupied the Straits, and the Greeks were promised land in the west. So, Turkey was surrounded and was set to lose a great deal of land. This is when the Greeks landed in Izmir in 1919, and by 1920, they had advanced all the way to Bursa. 
Alexander was therefore set to become a hero of Greece. His armies were on the advance and seemed unstoppable, especially as he was getting a lot of aid from the British and other Entente powers. But Alexander ruled over a pretty divided country, and really shouldn't have been king at this point. This was because his father, Constantine, was still alive. Constantine had ruled Greece since 1913, through the Balkan Wars, and had even expanded his country. But during the First World War, he faced a problem of who to side with. Like all European monarchs at that time, he was tied to pretty much every other monarch in some way. For instance, he was married to Sophia of Prussia, and therefore he was a brother-in-law to the Kaiser. But Sophia herself was a bit of an Anglophile, and made frequent trips to see Queen Victoria, her grandmother. Remember, the Tsar and the Kaiser were also both grandchildren of Victoria as well. Yet, during the war, Constantine remained neutral, believing that this was the best choice for Greece. After all, entering the war on the side of Germany would mean the British Navy could almost blockade the small country and cripple their economy. But then, siding with the Entente would mean Greece would have to fight against the Ottomans and Bulgaria. But Constantine was generally pro-German. When he was young, he was sent to Berlin for military training and even served in the German Imperial Guard, where he seems to have grown to love Prussian militarism. During the war though, the Kaiser promised to protect the Greeks in Turkey if he joined in the war on their side, but he still refused to do so. So the Entente believed that they could tempt the Greeks over to their side. They promised Cyprus parts of Turkey and the likes, but still Constantine refused. In fact, after the failure of Gallipoli, his decision to ignore the Entente was confirmed, and he even clashed with the French and Italians when he annexed northern Epirus. However, some in Greece grew angry with this approach, especially Prime Minister Venizelos. He wanted to join the Entente and even take part in the Gallipoli campaign. Then, acting without permission, he allowed the Entente to send troops through Greece to help out in the Balkans. In response to this though, the King and General Metaxas, who would be the future leader of Greece, allowed the Germans and Bulgarians to station troops in Fort Rappel. After a couple attacks on the palace, a coup took place, and those loyal to the Prime Minister set up a provisional government in Thessalonica. The national schism therefore had begun, and Greece really wouldn't recover from this for decades. Also, the British and French had landed in Athens on peaceful terms, but the paramilitary troops fought against them, forcing them to leave. Talk therefore quickly began on ways to oust the king, but the Russian Tsar was unwilling to support any such action. However, he only survived until 1917, and now the French and the British had complete freedom to move and forced Constantine to resign to Switzerland. They could have made his eldest son George king, but he had also trained in Germany and was suspected of being a Germanophile, so Alexander was brought in. Now the British and the French had a strong ally in the Balkans, and they were more than happy to support his wars against the Turks after World War I had concluded. But then he was bitten by a monkey, and the already divided Greeks had to choose who should be king next. In the end, they decided on Constantine, and he was brought back from exile, and this caused chaos once again. Well, I should say the chaos had never really subsided, as Venizelos had survived an assassination attempt in 1920 but now he was out of power again, and there was a clear split in the country. Many pro venizelos officers resigned, were fired or mutinied, and many Greeks, especially those in Asia Minor, were opposed to Constantine. For instance, one general in the Greek army wrote, The people here are generally disgusting. A swollen Venizelism prevails. It would really be worth handing over Smyrna to Kemal Ataturk, so as to kick all these worthless characters who behave like this after we have poured out such terrible blood here. My god, when shall I get away from this hell here? This general was in fact Prince Andrew, Constantine's younger brother, and the father of Prince Philip, the husband of Queen Elizabeth of Britain. He wrote this when Constantine began to launch a doomed offensive on Ankara. Now he was no longer just liberating Greeks, but conquering Turks out in the desert. Constantine wrote of how the war had descended into barbarism, saying, the Turks go out by night and massacre in the most atrocious manner our men or the lorry drivers who happen to be isolated. They mutilate them or even skin them, which enrages our soldiers to such an extent as to give rise to disagreeable reprisals. The war is developing into wild fighting, and that is the reason why we have so few prisoners. They are all massacred on the spot. Yet he continued to advance, 
and his lines became overstretched. But to make matters even worse, his return to power in Greece obviously angered the French, British and Italians. They stopped sending supplies to the country, and even took the opportunity to make peace with Ataturk. This, by the way, for many, was quite a relief, as many populations were now just tired of war and didn't want to continue fighting. Plus, to the north, the Soviets had taken over Armenia, so the Turks were free to focus all of their attention on Constantine's overstretched forces. The decisive battle, the Battle of Sakaya, ended in disaster for the Greeks. In fact, Prince Philip's father was blamed for the defeat for not following orders. However, there were a number of other factors. For instance, one general was showing signs of insanity and started to believe that his legs were made out of glass. After this battle, the Greeks were then on the run, and one year later, in September 1922, the Turks arrived in Izmir, then called Smyrna. Tens of thousands of Greeks and Armenians tried to escape as the Turks set fire to the city and carried out a number of terrible crimes. Over 150,000 Greek refugees were able to evacuate, but 30,000 or so Greek and Armenian men were deported into the interior of the country, dying in harsh conditions. And remember, this comes shortly after the Armenian Genocide. As for the number of people who died within the city, the ranges vary quite a bit, from 10,000 to 125,000. So, in this entire disastrous campaign, Churchill estimated 250,000 deaths that could be blamed on the monkey. But even more than that, the absolute destruction of Smyrna ended the Greek presence in Anatolia, something that had existed for over 3,000 years. After all, remember the Greek city of Troy is now in Turkey, not in Greece. Plus, in the aftermath of the war, the Turks and Greeks agreed to a population exchange. So, a further 1.2 million Greeks left Turkey, leaving very few behind. Those that did stay behind were also often subject to pogroms. So, before the war, Greeks made up around 25-35% to of the population in Istanbul. But then this number quickly dropped to 12%, then following pogroms like in 1955, the number has practically gone down to zero. So, as one Greek writer said, it is no exaggeration to call the year 1922 the most calamitous in modern Hellenic history. As for Greece, well there was a coup in 1922, and Constantine was forced to flee. In fact, so too did Prince Philip, who, as a baby, was escorted out of the country in a British ship. Others, like Hatzianestis, were caught and put on trial for their defeats. He was executed for treason, but his last words were, my only shame is that I commanded an army of deserters. After this, George II, Constantine's eldest son, took the throne, but not for very long. This is because there was a pro-royalist coup the next year, but this failed. George was then forced to flee and live in exile in Romania, and a republic was born. But this republic would only last until the 1930s, when Venizelos would begin to lose his grip on power to the People's Party. They were more conservative, and many suspected that they were monarchists. So, there were more attempted coups to remove them from power, and after them, the People's Party held a referendum to get the monarchy back. George returned and threw all of his support behind Metaxas. Metaxas then took power in 1936, creating an authoritarian state which ruled Greece right up until the Italian invasion, which ruled Greece all the way up to 1941. So, all of this chaos was caused by a monkey. But do you know of any other animals that changed the course of history? Leave yours in the comments below. Thanks again to The Sandbox for sponsoring this video. 